Welcome to the Assistant Lab podcast, hosted by Victoria Ratton and Arnel Martin. This podcast is dedicated to the executive assistant profession, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've created this podcast for the outliers, the linchpins, the assistants who are serious about their careers. This is a podcast for those who are preparing for the future today. This is a space for no-nonsense content, benchmarking and tracking industry and world trends, as well as interesting interviews with exceptionally inspirational people. The goal here is to stimulate new ways of thinking and being in this profession. So, on with the show. Welcome to this next episode of the Assistant Lab. Today's guest is not from a PA background, but he knows the role exceptionally well. That's Mr Nick Fewins a team workologist, but actually many assistants have known Nick for a long, long time now because he spoke at major PA events, not just in the UK, but worldwide. And um, a more memorable moment, I think, for one of the events he spoke at for me back in 2013, 2014. Um, It actually happened to be his birthday when he was giving a keynote speech for me. So I got 250 PAs to sing happy birthday to him. So I'm sure that will be one of the more, more memorable highlights from his career for sure. Um, But today we're talking all things leadership, management, um, teamwork, because that's what Nick is an absolute expert at. So Anel and I wanted to get into the nitty gritty about what's happened, you know, kind of during the pandemic and since now that we've gone into this mostly hybrid way of working. We also talked to Nick about his book launch last year and the lessons he learned going through that. And how much impact his book has has had to so many different types of professions. Um, The book's called Team Lead Succeed. Many PAs have already got it. If you haven't, check it out on Amazon. But enjoy. Well, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Fins, and welcome to the Assistant Lab. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Lovely to be here. I think Anel and I knew at some point you were going to be on this podcast and we were hoping to. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, had a mem- I had a memory recently where I was trying to figure out what year it was, but the three of us having a beer together, and I think it was in Leeds. It was in but Leeds. When, how I, I was going to the year, but it was in Leeds. Yeah, I, I, it, was, it was at the, um, I think it was at the Hayes, the Hayes event um, that you um, wow. asked me if I could come along and speak at the reason I remember it it was uh the day after my birthday and when I got on stage you got everybody to sing happy birthday to me <laughs> I remember that now yeah there was 250 PAs and I don't think we would have made it to like the x factor or Britain's Got Talent in terms of tuning in but I thought we did a good rendition <laughs> it, it was it was one of those memories that will always remain with me Oh, well, I'm glad we were able to do something lovely, but we have all trained in the same room together, assistants. So we, we've got some history, the three of us, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, but Nick, what we always like to start off with, whether you've been an assistant or not, and um, we always like to go back to when you were, uh, people were 16 years old and when they started to come out of the education system or if you went to uni and kind of threading that story as to how you've got to where you are today. Yeah, sure. Um, no, I didn't go to university. Um, and it's, I love that fact because I think it's, it's one of those things that, that proves that you don't need to go to, to university to do what you love and, and what you're passionate about. Um, so I, I left school uh, at 18 with some pretty miserable a level grades and and um, I got a lo- lots of O levels. I think I had ten O levels, but again the grades weren't that great. Um, so um, couldn't go to university, uh, and uh, I loved playing Monopoly. So I thought, hey, why don't I join a bank and then I can play Monopoly with real money? Uh, <laughs> so. So, I never knew that. Never knew yeah, that. Yeah. So, so that's what I did. I, I, I applied to go into Barclays, and um, I'm actually colourblind in red and green, so I nearly didn't get into the bank. They gave me, they gave, they spotted that I was, I was colourblind, so they gave me a test of um, the putting out the different coloured banknotes in front of me and telling and asking me <laughs> which one was red, which one. <laughs> 
coloured green because we had the old green pound notes in those days. Um, and, and I thought, well, it was stupid because they said, well, tell us which one is the pound note. And I thought, well, it doesn't matter about the colour. It's got the it's got the number one on it. <laughs> I can read it. Yeah, I can read it. So, yeah, so I, I, I did all the branch banking stuff. I did the cashiering. Um, oh, actually, in those days, people used to have paper statements. Uh, and I was the statements clerk and I used to hate it at the, the, the end of the month and the beginning of the, the month because that's when everybody had their statements. So I go rock up into the branch and there would be maybe 1,500, 1,600 statements that I had to rip oh. each, each one manually and then put them into envelopes. And then some of them used to like to have their checks sent back to them in their statements. So I had to go and find all their checks, put them in order. Ah, oh. but that sounds um, soul, this soul destroying, Nick. It was, it was. <laughs> yes. um, but it, it was, a, it was the first time that I came across behavioral difference um, because I did a wonderful thing called the tea and coffee run. Uh, so I worked in a branch of 30 people and in the morning and afternoon there was tea and coffee. And this is where I started understanding all these different preferences that we have, you know, some like their tea strong, you know, weak, some with two sugars, one with a sweetener. And then they all had their particular biscuits that they enjoyed eating. So, um, yeah, I, I did that for about six months. And, and by the end of it, I knew everybody's preference, um, which was good. Uh, moved on, uh, moved around the southwest of, of the UK, uh, again in branches, ended up in the regional office. I worked for the regional director. Uh, and uh, then it was in the days when uh, computers were first coming in. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> There was this wonderful spreadsheet called Lotus One Two Three, and um, and um, I I was able to create a, a program that uh, then automatically calculated the interest and commission charges for customers rather than doing it manually, and um, the profits of the branch went up twenty five percent in a quarter, um, and. That's, that's why I got headhunted to go to the regional office. Uh, then I got headhunted from there to go to the global finance operation in Poole. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's when I became a, 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 an operational leader uh, of others. And then eventually got headhunted to work up in London with the chief exec, a guy called John Varley. And yeah. uh, yeah, that's when I was. That's when I got into. I became an accredited project manager, and then eventually a change director. Uh, and after twenty years, somebody said, "You're really good with people. Why don't you take redundancy and set up a training company?" Which was almost twenty years ago. So amazing. Yeah. Wait, I didn't realise you'd been operating that long as a trainer. Twenty years. Yeah, yeah, I did twenty. I did twenty-one years in Barclays from from the age of nineteen until I was forty, and I hit sixty last year. So I've been training for training teams for twenty years, That's and incredible. still love it. Still love it. That's as though incredible. it was yesterday. Well, that brings me nicely to the next question. You know, um, when in this journey did your path cross with? personal assistance, executive assistance. When did you get in contact with these people? The first time that I really started to value and appreciate um, the assistance or an assistant was when I when I got to, to become a leader of a team. Mm -hmm. And uh, the team was uh, 20 strong. Uh, and as part of that, um, they said, you can have an assistant to, to support you. And... Again, based on understanding behavioral differences, I knew that there were a lot of leaders that they took on board what I call yes people, yes assistants. So these assistants that were just basically the leader would say, I need this, 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 uh, and the, the assistant would just go away and do it. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, no, I don't want that. I don't want an assistant that agrees with me all the time. I want an assistant who challenges me, makes me think differently. 
So I went out of my way to find an assistant that behaviorally was totally my opposite. Um, and she was amazing. Uh, I'm very, very people centric. She was very strategic in her thinking. Um, and she had a really bad reputation. Um, there were teams that I'd heard of before that just wanted to get rid of her. She was my greatest um, ally companion um, that I had. And I used to, when I moved teams, I used to take her with me because because of that ability to challenge my thinking and, and say, hey, Nick, you've mentioned that, you know, you're going to do this or you're going to put this strategy in place. Have you thought about X, Y and Z? And suddenly I go, my goodness, I haven't. So that's that's when I really valued and, and started to appreciate the role of the assistant. Um, and, you know, I love the fact that, um, you know, one of my quotes is, you know, the great leaders um, invariably have a great, great assistant standing by them because the word assistant comes from Latin assistare, which is to stand by. And I, and I think they, they do. They stand right beside you um so that that's that's why i've always valued in a, in a, an appreciated uh assistance and i've always had them at the heart of the teams that i've i've led myself because they know more than all the other leaders or managers or supervisors in your team because virtually everything in terms of communication goes through them to you as a leader or from you as a leader through them to the rest of the team. Um, so they know exactly what's going on. And, um, you know, that I used to have many, many chats with, with my assistant, you know, what, what's the feeling in the team? You know, um, anything that I need to know that's going on that sometimes isn't said to the leader, but would be said to the assistant. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and the skills they've got as well are just just incredible. Um, I do find that, and that's why I write a lot of articles um, for assistants to read. They have got some amazing skills, but I think sometimes their personality they hide their light under a bushel. Um, they don't they don't um, shout about their skills from the rooftop. They expect others to appreciate and value them. Uh, and I do think that sometimes uh, assistants need to say, look at me. This is the wonderful skills that I bring to the yep. team, and the organization. You know, Nick, it's so funny that you mentioned that. You know, I've been tracking the World Economic Forum's top 10 skills for the future for many years now. Assistants consistently pick about eight out of 10 yeah. without breaking a sweat. I keep saying to assistants, why are you not using this verbiage on your LinkedIn profile? This is top of mind. HR leaders, CEOs are looking in terms of those skills. Why are you not aligning with that? Especially because you tick eight out of those 10 boxes easily. The average assistant, not even the exceptional assistant. So I, I totally agree there. And I, and I always say to Vic, if I, if I had a magic wand and I could change one thing for the profession, it wouldn't be job titles. It wouldn't be salaries. It would be their confidence. If I could just give everyone 10% more confidence, yeah. they could sort out all their own issues. So I totally, that totally resonates, Nick. I, I, I'm, I'm great to hear. I, 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 knew, I, I knew it would with uh, obviously knowing you, Anel. So um, it, I had a lovely story a while back. I was working with a, a, a team. Uh, it was a leadership team of 10. And... Um, the assistant was there, um, the executive assistant. And uh, after the session, she came up to me. She said, thank you so much. Really enjoyed myself. Um, she said, but I was surprised that I was in this, this training today. And I said, why? She said, because I'm only the assistant. And, and I said, well, hang on. You're only the assistant. You're the executive assistant. So I took her to one side quietly and I said, just let's have a look through, you know, what you've done. I said, you've you've managed my diary and 10 other leaders diaries to get this training in place. Um, so certainly um, you've got time management skills. 
I said, you've negotiated with the, the hotel where the training took place in terms of what we wanted, the, the price of it. So, so you've done a lot of stakeholder management there. I said, you've done, you, you've had risk management because one of the days that we chose, uh, there was an operational issue. So it had to be postponed, but she'd already thought and had another date in the diary penciled in in that case um i said you've communicated about the training to to all those that are coming along um i said you're building trust because i said you've taken it on board yourself to actually have a um a social event after the training so there's all these different things and i said you know and it goes back to what you were saying and now it's it's the confidence it's just being able to say yeah I've got these skills and they are valuable. Yeah. I think Absolutely. part, and I'm probably going to be a bit controversial here, um, but I think part of the problem is, I mean, I think now, and I've said this before to now, if I was back on the job market now, I probably wouldn't want to be an assistant. And that's a very strange thing for the CEO of the national body for assistance in the UK to say. But the job adverts do not whet my appetite. And they're, it's not appetising to me. It's, it's dull. I'd rather watch paint drier than go for the vast majority of roles that are on the market at the moment. <laughs> Off him. Sorry. <clears throat> Hopefully we can edit that. We'll bit. tweeze that out. <laughs> I always cough on this podcast. Um, but you're coupled with that. And then roles that do look good being missold. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so you get in there and find out it's boring. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's got to, you know, the job, the job specs got to be something that lights your fire. You know, it won't, you've got to be wanting to get out of bed and enthused to be able to go in and, and do that job role. And you're right. Some of the, some of the, um, the ways in which the assistant role is, is mapped out with the, the responsibilities and the objectives. It's a case of now I'll give that a miss. Well, I can't Nick, you, sorry, you and now. Sorry, Nick. I want to just ask you, as somebody who has recruited assistants, who's worked with, I'm assuming, HR business partners, I sometimes feel there's a huge disconnect. The executive knows exactly what they're looking for. They might not be able to verbalize that. But HR then goes to a stock standard job description and a stock standard advert. And then we have leaders complaining it isn't a good match. I often say to people who contact me looking for a referral or looking for a match that the most important thing is personality. And it's so interesting that you said you look for an opposite. I've yeah. had great results working for complete opposites or somebody so similar that you almost anticipate 10 steps ahead. You sort yeah. of very much in sync or polar opposites and that tends to work. But I do think communication style, conflict style, all that kind of stuff. It's not just the operational. It is, is it a personality fit? I'm spending yeah. more time awake with my boss than I am with my husband. So that relationship has to be good. And we have to be, we've sort of got to find that alignment. And I sometimes feel those job adverts, I'm going to be honest, it's not just a UK thing. In South Africa, if I look at the jobs, job specs, when you do see one that's interesting, the salary offer, I look at and I think, you've got to be kidding. You are looking for champagne on a beer budget. Good luck with that. <laughs> um, you know, Or stuff that you look at and you think, that's not what a proper assistant does. You are looking for a clock. You are looking for a, a completely operational junior that is not an executive assistant so i think yeah. there's, there's so much education and i mean us talking to each other doesn't get the word out i think there, there has to be that information fed back into hr teams the people yeah. write the ads yeah I, I i think you're totally right i think um you know the some of the terminology and some of the titles that are used um have been blurred by hr over the years you know and it's 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 especially with the assistant it's a legacy in terms of how assistants used to be not how they should be now and in the future um you know i, I get a lot of um misunderstanding between those people that call themselves leaders and those people that call themselves managers um and again 
leaders set the direction they set the strategy um because that's what the word leader means and they, they bring people on the journey with them manager again comes from the latin for hand so managers are hands-on it's operational the leader does the strategy the managers execute it but again hr sometimes they blurred the lines so people sometimes don't understand the actual job they should be doing and um and i think it's it's exactly the same sometimes with assistants and when you look in actual fact what they're describing is not an assistance role it's a, it's a it's an office junior you know yeah, yeah. absolutely there was quite a controversial debate at the weekend and i i used to comment on as you know both of you know um i used, I used to be very hot-headed and i still am to a degree but i've learned my lessons now about not commenting on a lot of linkedin debates but it, it came up again over the weekend and loads of people were messaging it to me privately saying look there's this bit of a spat going on about um there was an article basically saying uh please don't call us assistance and i do you know what i kind of thought no i'm not getting involved in this because this, this is the same boring conversations we were having 10 years ago that's not what the big issues are with the, the role at the, the moment and how people are feeling about being in the profession and so i read it all digested it all, and saw people going going backwards and forwards with each other but i was just like no i'm i'm out way. i'm out on this one <laughs> yeah. well yeah. well to to tie into that controversy i always and I'm, I'm unapologetic about this i do not care what they call me they can call me chief cook bottle washer you know i i really don't care i care what's paid in at the end of the month when i get my, yeah. my salary and i care about my own perception of how i fit into the team so I try to be a professional. I try to bring the best that I can offer. And people resonate with that. So the title is quite irrelevant. I go by Anel and I know what I do for a living. So I'm not fixated on that. And I think sometimes it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I honestly feel that sometimes we've got much bigger fish to fry than naming conventions. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I I totally agree. It's the value value that you add, not the not the title of the job description. Yeah, yeah, totally. And so, totally. putting it back on the kind of leader leadership. So, you work with a lot of C suite teams, executive teams, leadership teams. I mean, leadership is massively, massively changed in the last decade, and more so since the pandemic. Because let's face it. I don't know any CEOs that have worked through a global pandemic before. And frankly, as the CEO of a tiny business, I was like a rabbit in the headlights. Yeah. What, what's been some of the kind of changes you've seen as sort of where some of the dynamics have changed yeah. in kind of recent years? Sure. I mean, I think the, 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 the big chestnut at the moment is hybrid working. And it is causing some leaders and organizations an absolute nightmare um because um you can't build an effective team that works efficiently when all you do is have your team meetings on zoom or teams you've got to be in the room you've got to uh, see people giving a furtive glance to each other when you say something so you can pick up maybe something's not resonating quite right with them um you need the whole body language the nod of the head um and you can't do a lot of this stuff on on teams or zoom um in addition there's so many distractions you know there's dogs and cats walking in on the screen behind you there's <laughs> yes. there's, there's amazon deliveries and, say, and and all those things distract from your team meeting um yeah. so there's a lot of commentators that i've heard um people have spoke at conferences that, that that are quite well respected in the industry that have said hybrid working is the way forward i totally disagree i think yes you can have elements of hybrid working mm. um 
but I know, as I said, CEOs and lead, some leaders of big organizations tearing their hair out. And I've said one, at least one of the things that you need to do if you've decided you're going to go down the, the hybrid working route is get all of your team in the same room on the same day at least once a week. And on that one day, you can really focus on your teamwork. Mm. Um, you know, Nick, I think you, you've you hit something on the head there for me personally. I do think a lot of your communication, a lot of the, the subtleties, the nuances go missing on calls, you know? So there's also that slight delay between what the eye sees and what I project. So, yeah. you know, I think there, there is a, a massive loss of communication. And I do think sometimes also um, you, you get to that point where the instruction, you've got that ambiguity that pops in or that, that misunderstanding. I do think sometimes face-to-face -face things do just work more efficiently. Yeah. And, you know, we, we miss out on the the quick chat by the coffee machine. Um you know, stuff. you know, grabbing a sandwich with somebody and eating it in the canteen or whatever, or in the old days, it used to be going down to the old bike sheds and having a smoke with you, you with some of your mates. <laughs> you'd, learn, you'd learn so much there, and there was so much value in these those, those things. Plus, you get to eat cakes as well when it was somebody's birthday or they were celebrating. Mind you, you're not allowed to bring cakes into the office anymore, are you? I know, I know. I saw that in the press earlier this year and I was like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. You, you know, Nick, you, you mentioned that just that informal connection. I remember as an assistant, very large organisation, 22,000 headcount and complex systems. I would buy myself a cup of coffee and I would walk around the little smoker's corner. There was one lady who had been there since Noah's Ark. And I, she would say to me, you look so stressed. And I would say, oh, I'm having this problem. And she would literally walk around to the next people. And by the time I got back to my desk, problem solved. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I could not have done that at my desk. So yeah. if you don't even know where to unravel a problem, sometimes just that conversation brings yeah. you back into the loop. Exactly. And I was talking to somebody about, you know, one of the one of the vital areas of teamwork is collaboration, mm. sharing our knowledge and experience with others. Well, as you've said, and now if you've if you've got a problem, if you're in the office, somebody can say, hang on, let me sit down beside you. I'll talk you through it on the PC. Yeah. You try doing that on Zoom or, or yeah. you know, Teams or whatever. So much it, harder. Yeah. 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 I think, um, I mean, part of being an assistant, you're supposed to be at the cold face. I don't understand how you can do that sitting at home in your pyjamas five days a week. And let's be honest, some people aren't, still aren't getting dressed every day. Yeah. But I also, I look at it from my personal perspective. I always joke that I was an acquired taste as a PA because it, it didn't fit the stereotypical. Like I've had to really graft hard to get where I did in my career because of the background I'm from. And and actually, I part of me me selling me into my colleagues and the direct reports of my leader was cultivating those relationships face to face so that they just didn't just judge me based on what they'd heard about my CV and that yeah. and the background I come from. Actually, they can you know judge me face to face and building those relationships. Like I wouldn't have got as far as I did in my career without that. Absolutely no way at all. Um, oh. No. I probably wouldn't have got past a junior secretary role, as they were called back then. So it was yeah. vital to me. Yeah. And and, and the other thing that, that, that amazes me is, hang on, we've been through this pandemic and, you know, we've all worked from home. But has anybody um, um, had their contracts changed to actually say, oh, now you can actually work at home two, three, four times a week? I don't think many people have had that and many organisations have yeah. done it. So ultimately, your contract is the same as before the pandemic. So personally, I think you should be in the office <laughs> because at the end of the day, you signed up to be in the office even before this. So <laughs> It's true. It is true. I think that you're right. Though I've seen some reports of British firms and saying, you know, we've had to do a bit of a trial and error here. We've tried this. It hasn't worked. Productivity's gone down. And and obviously, because we're apparently aiming for innovation and growth in the UK, okay. um, allegedly, um, they that's going to be quite difficult to do with 
in some industries, certainly in some yeah. sectors with people at home full time. Um, I mean, frankly, I miss, that's what I miss about the corporate world. There's not a lot I miss, but I yeah. miss the, yeah. <laughs> the buzz of the office, definitely. No. But I, I've, I've been working with a, a really forward thinking organisation. Um, there's 25 of them. Uh, so it's a, it's a um, SME. Um, but what they did is they actually worked it out as a team because they see themselves as one team and said, yeah. OK, you know, some people it, it, it is beneficial sometimes to work from home, you know, have that quiet time and get your head down, etc. Mm -hmm. But all they did is they worked through it and they came up with a compromise that um, two days out of the five, everybody is in the office yeah. and they as a group decided which of those two days it would be um and it's going it's going great guns some people say we'll be in every day but at least they know that everybody is going to be in two days a week um and i think that's what a lot of organizations need to wake up and smell the roses because i think the longer you leave it the worse it's going to become uh and teamwork is just going to fall off the edge of a cliff and also i think the emotional aspect to this because you know i'm thinking about myself in the training space i could have a morning session stop at lunchtime do my laundry come back for the afternoon session the quality of life was you know there were certain benefits for me that i had by working remotely i'm putting myself in that position thinking i would prefer flexibility if i could say you know um, instead of only working online, I'm happy to come in this day, but this day, you know, the flexibility portion of it, I think is appealing. But like you say, you, you're missing out on having those conversations, getting everyone around the table. If you really want to innovate, I can't, you know, your cup, as somebody who works in the creative space, I know you're an author as well. Your cup becomes empty. Sometimes you need to cross pollinate with others to spark yeah. your own creativity, your own ability to problem solve. So I think that is a very relevant concern. Yeah. Plus, 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 there is another benefit of, um, uh, like yourself, you know, doing the training actually face-to-face -face with organisations. Um, Absolutely. It, and, the, and, the, and the big benefit is it stops my wife from killing me. <laughs> I, I, I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. <laughs> Have you, I mean, obviously there's some millennial CEOs um, in the workplaces now, not in large numbers, but um, we do, I don't know about SA actually, and now, but apparently in the UK, we're going to make up the biggest voting demographic next year when we have our general election. And we are becoming the biggest number and age group in, in the workplace. And I have met um, a couple of Gen Z CEOs, mostly in the tech world, I have to say, like, do you think there'll be a fundamental like change in leadership? Because they do seem to be quite different in terms of what they want and what staff or teams want from them as leaders, you know, uh, ethics, sustainability and things yeah. that leaders didn't have to think about really 20 years ago. I think certainly sustainability is, is uh, another big area of change for organisations um and quite rightly so you know at the end of the day we've got to save the planet um and therefore we've got to think about how we do business differently so that's certainly one shift that i've seen um and again not so much with a particular age group um because that crosses across all age groups but the other thing i have noticed uh in terms of the leadership when I started, if you like, um, which was rather a long time ago now, um, which actually I find really bizarre. Uh, you know, when you have to put your, your date of birth in on these computer things or on your apps and that, and I have to keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. <laughs> uh, nightmare. nightmare. Uh, anyway, I digress. Um, yeah, the um, the thing I have seen changed is is the mindsets and the training for leaders um in the old days it was very much um strategic and it was about maximizing the value to stake stakeholders if it was a it was, if it was a 
public listed company um, or maximizing the profits if it, it was, was a private company. Um, and you did that by hook and by crook and by um, a lot of the time cracking the whip in terms of the staff. Um, I've I've started, I coined a phrase, um, I call it emp empathic strategic leadership. Hmm. So um, it's about having empathy with uh, your your teams, your members of staff, but also thinking strategically about which direction the organization's got, got to go. And I, and I put the word empathic at the front because it's about doing right by people for the business. So that's how I like to explain it to people. Um, and each two years I do a survey on LinkedIn and I go out to people and just say, what are the attributes that you want to see in your leaders? And that hasn't changed significantly over the last five years. And they say that they want their leaders to be trustworthy. Um, so so we can put aside politicians. Um, <laughs> they don't they don't hit that uh, hit. <laughs> globally. Um, <laughs> um they want their leaders the top four so it's trustworthy was in fourth they want their leaders to be visionary which is being creative and innovative and thinking about and planning for the future second they wanted their leaders to show integrity um so again politicians can be put to one side um and then the the number one thing which is why i coined this empathic strategic leadership is they wanted their leaders to show empathy um and and ultimately a lot of time when i talk talk at conferences about leadership ultimately it's just another job role in the team yeah. whilst it's got leaders have got ultimate responsibility you are just still a team member you have got you know a team member with different responsibilities um and some leaders i still think they don't get it they see themselves apart from their team rather or than above part of the team yeah exactly yeah so i think there's some work to be done but i'm i'm certainly seeing a shift in more values driven leadership um i know sometimes the phrase servant leadership is used but for me the word servant just conjures up sometimes the wrong connotation with people um you know i, I get i get what's behind that meaning but the word servant just doesn't sit right for me mm. um yeah. nick you have published a book that's very successful i want to hear a little bit more about the process of writing the book what's the feedback been like yeah you know any any special things around the book you want to share with us yeah it's great i mean it's it's been a fantastic journey and again um a big thank you to um covid in lockdown because that's when i wrote it you know <laughs> nobody wanted uh, a facilitator we couldn't be in the same room as people um the only conferences i did were online so um mm. it, it meant people have been asking me for a book for the last 20 years and i've, and I've just haven't had the time you know we're traveling all all over the uk around europe and the world um so i thought right now's my opportunity um First of all, I went on a course to learn how to write a book. Um, a fabulous woman, uh, which was bizarre. There's a there's a lady on LinkedIn called Alice Fewings. Mm -hmm. She's no not connected with me <laughs> at all. But I was just <laughs> bizarrely searching to see how many other Fewingses were online. And Alice Fewings does this wonderful course how to work, use LinkedIn better, more effectively, and um, on that course was a woman called Karen Williams, and she runs a course called the Smart Author System. Mm -hmm. And that teaches you the end to end process of writing to getting your book published. So I so I invested in that um, and that made me really think about the audience for the book. Um, and, and one of the, the, the key audiences were, were, were the, the assistants. 
And the reason being, I wanted to give them a voice. You know, like I said, sometimes they don't speak up. So I wanted something about teamwork that enabled them to say to their their leaders or their team members, do you know what? I've read this book and I don't think our collaboration is working effectively or we haven't got enough accountability in our team. So um, I started, started writing a draft. Uh, and again, I really value assistance because they love to learn and they love to support and help others. So I just went out and said, look, you know, I'm writing a book. Um, would anybody like to have a read of a chapter? I said, I don't want you to read the whole 21 chapters, but could you read a chapter? And I had about eight or nine assistants came back and said they, they would love to help me out. So that gave me an idea of whether what I was writing resonated with them which fortunately it did um then i there's a there's a chapter on leadership i the reason i call it team lead succeed is the majority of it is about teamwork it's about behaviors understanding who's in your team behaviorally and also from the technical skills that they bring so that's the who's in your team and then you need to know how effectively your team is working so that's where there's 16 chapters about different areas of teamwork so that's why it starts with team the lead bit there's a chapter about leadership and and again I was I was very fortunate to uh I asked 12 leaders so six men and six women that I know I've worked with and I know their staff see them as exemplary leaders and I said could you put your take about leadership? Because, yeah, I know lots of things about leadership, but I don't know everything. Yeah. So they all, apart from one who was uh, couldn't make, make the, uh, the publishing deadline, so I've got six men, five women leaders um, from all different industries, and they give their take on leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how it was sort of developed. And and since it was published March 2022, so just over 12 months ago, it's just been in, it's just been incredible. Um, it's it's hard work because it's a self-published book, so I haven't had any royal royalties coming in from public. <laughs> um, nothing like that. But it means that I own the intellectual property. I can market it however I like. I can do whatever I like with it. You know, it still goes on to Amazon and Waterstones and all the all the online um, areas. But I'm in control of it. So um, so it's been an incredible journey. You know, I, I, I always take a copy with me just to take a photo of it somewhere. And again, readers have been really good. And they've those that have got copies, they've taken some really creative photos of where they've read it. So um, I don't know if you know Tracy Binney. Yes, Tracy, yeah. Tracy went on a, a cruise to Alaska and took the book with her. And she <laughs> he took an amazing shot with the Alaska mountains and the and the book in the foreground. So um I've had lots of assistants doing that and also giving some really good feedback um on amazon about it so Tr tracy was one paula western burt she <laughs> she used it she shared it with her executive team she said it's made a big difference so um that's the thing that really resonates and keeps me warm at night knowing that what's written in there is doing what I wanted it to do, which was to give a voice to people to help them and their teams to achieve even greater success. So, um, yeah, and it's, it's, there's been some bizarre things on the way. I, I took it to, I went on holiday to Palma. Uh, we ended up in the Hard Rock Cafe. And I said to my wife, or, oh, you know, I could take it with, a, you know, put on a guitar or something like that. And we'll talk about, you know, how teamwork is like playing a guitar with all the different notes and the strings and um we were sat there the 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 female waitress came up took our drinks order and then she came back and she said um i saw your book on the table and she says uh, i looked at the title of it and i'm into teamwork and leadership so she said i, I went out the back and went on amazon 
because she said, I thought it was just a book that you've taken on holiday with you. And she says, I've looked on Amazon and there's your photo. You're the author. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. That's awesome. so, she, so she bought a copy and she said, could you, she gave me a piece of paper. She said, could you write a personal note? So when I get the book, I can stick it in there. So did that, had our meal. And then out of the corner of my eye, I said to my wife, I said, one of her friends, one of the other waitresses is pushing her. And uh, anyway, she eventually she came forward. She said, she says, you wouldn't mind having some photos taken with me with your book so that I can and then you can share them with me. Oh, oh, that's, lovely. Yeah. that's really nice. And I've got even more respect for people who self-publish as well, because it's. Yeah. It's tough. I remember Susie yeah. Baron Stubbley going through that, and she did that way before. Yeah, before like it was many as easy yeah. or before there were big systems in place to do that. You know, mm. I, I know that you know the the Amazon publishing is you know they do actually walk you through step by step. Just a quick one, Nick. Um, is this your first book? Yes, and it will be my last. <laughs> that was the next question. <laughs> Um, well, it's funny, I, I was thinking of, of doing something um, uh, slightly more, well, people have said back to me to say that the book is actually quite readable, because there's stories in there that I bring things to life, and they are, they are true stories, the only things I've changed sometimes is sort of a location or the names of people for, for protect anonymity. the guilty, but all the all the all the stories are in there. Um, but uh, I, d I did think about, I love etymology, so where words derive yeah. from, where they come from, and I love business idioms and, and facts. And uh, I was speaking at a, a conference for assistance up in Manchester last year, and um, I was talking about conflict, and um, that comes from the Latin to strike together. So most people see conflict as negative. But if you if you struck two bottles, glass bottles together, yes, it would be. If you struck some flint together, you could make fire, which could be positive. Yeah. So I, I mentioned Latin and then somebody said, did you go to school with Julius Caesar? <laughs> and um, <I'm> rude. <laughs> I know. I know. Exactly. And um, and I said, well, no, I said, but, but weirdly, I said, um, Oh, Julius, he, he's, he's given us a, a word that we use, a couple of words that we use in everyday life. I said to do with um, to do with time. Uh, and eventually we got there. He's given us the month of July. Um, and then his predecessor came along and said, well, if he can have July, I'm an emperor of Rome. So I want a I want a month named after me. So that's where we get August. So. We've got July and August, so. October, the word October, Octo is eight, but it's actually our 10th month because July and August have been squeezed in and shunting all the all the other months thereafter. So like November is, is means nine, December is 10. Um, so they were they, they were fascinated by this. And, and I said, uh, and of course, if it weren't for cows, I said we wouldn't be in the room now because um the 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 word for cow in latin is vacca mm -hmm. which is where we get the word vaccination because mm -hmm. vaccination all started by uh an english doctor called edward jenner that actually it was to do with um milkmaids getting cowpox and he injected it into a boy which stopped him getting smallpox so mm -hmm. that's how we get that's how we get the word vaccination it's from the latin word cow so i did um, essentially we need you on the pub quiz team down <laughs> you're a fountain of knowledge like seriously um, so on, on on linkedin i'll be getting some good traction every friday i do a viewings fascinating friday fact um so it, I will it be tuning into that mm. yeah. so if you look out on a friday on my linkedin post it, it's to do with uh you know a, a fact you know i did one the other day about uh, you know the ideas bubble the light yeah. bulb that originates from um the cartoon felix the cat oh yeah 
Felix the cat was the first cartoon that they had a thought bubble with a with a light bulb in it. Um, so if I am going to write another book, um, it it will be uh, facts about um, our work journeys. You know, so right from when you look at an advert uh, that comes from the Latin ad is to two and, and vertari is to turn. So a job advert is meant to turn your head. Mm. So just little snippets like that of, of going throughout the, the, the life cycle of uh, a job. That, so that, that's possibly in the background. Um, but going back to what you're saying about self-published, yeah, it, it's a hard, it, it is really hard. It is really difficult. So anybody thinking of writing a self-published book, don't do it lightly. Um, also, don't go in for any business book awards. <laughs> um, I, I put mine. I put mine into the business book awards um, for this year. There were just under three hundred business books that went into the categories. Only seven percent were self-published. Uh, and last oh. week, last week I went up to the um, shortlist awards, and virtually all the i think they were shortlisted to a hundred books uh and i would say 98 percent of them were by publishers um and the reason being they want to say look we've helped somebody publish a book and lo and behold they're all in the um the awards and the box. times bestseller and yeah all that palaver yeah, yeah. And, and so i just been really pleased at the all the five star reviews it's getting on Amazon, the feedback I've had for me, it's not about the award. It's 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 about the reward that I get from people saying that has helped me and my team. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, Nick. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always I think having gone through the experience myself, having had a book published, I always say to people, I like being a published author. I don't like writing books. So yeah. I, I had a giggle when you said, I'm not yet, you know, I'm not mentally, I'm not there yet. But also, yeah. I don't know if you experienced the same thing. When I sat down and I wrote it, I wrote in, in a bubble. When I realized it is now out in the wild. And like you say, it pops up in the strangest places. No. People, you know, people pop up and say, oh, you know, I've, I've got your book or, you know, somebody loaned me your book and you have this discussion. But just knowing that one ripple, that one person's feedback, it, it really does make the entire yeah. process worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, uh, most definitely. I think, you know, that's, it's, as I said, it's just over a year since it was published and it's, um, it, it's starting to have that ripple out effect now. Um, but it is tough. You have to do a lot of marketing to get the the, the message out there. Um, but, you know, once it starts rolling and you get some positive feedback, um, then uh, it's like the snowball going down the hill that it gets bigger and bigger. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, I, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed the journey, um, as I said, apart from writing it, where <laughs> you, get, you get halfway through the book writing it and you think, have I written that before? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and there's a point in the editing where you think i'm just making this worse yeah i'm yeah. now i'm now breaking down i'm not fixing anything i'm not polishing yeah. anything so yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is quite an intensive process yes yeah you're, yeah. you're both doing a great job of selling this to me yeah <laughs> And I, and and the amount of authors who say the same thing. I remember Vanessa Valley saying this to me after she published Hills is Still. It was like over 10 years ago now. Yeah. And they've been asking her to update it, but she literally, because she remembers so vividly that first yeah. process, yeah. she's like, no. And, Not and, yet. and, and the, other th the, the other thing which sticks in my head um, last year, I was asked to speak at a big uh, European leadership conference, 170 people there um so i was paid to speak as the keynote speaker and then they said we want 170 copies of your book so each of the delegates can take it away uh the conference was at the runnymede hotel just by near heathrow yeah yeah uh, yeah 
And uh, the night before my phone goes, um, I pick it up. It's the uh, leader that's organised the conference. And uh, he said, Nick, he said, um, he says, you're in Bournemouth, aren't you? I said, yeah. Uh, he said, uh, I've just had a look. Running Mead's about two hours drive away. I said, yeah. He said, and you're not on till one o'clock in the afternoon speaking. He said, um, I suppose you wouldn't come up early and sign all 170 books. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I thought I had a hand transplant. I couldn't feel my hand come the the, the end of the, the 170. I can yeah. feel the arthritis for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do. I still do find it weird. A, a lot of people, and again, I, I've said I'm quite happy to do it. Mm. Rather than get the book off Amazon, they will get the book from me so that I post it to them. And I, I write. I haven't got a stamp or anything because I don't think it does it justice. I write uh, uh, a little note and sign it in the front cover. Um, but again, that's one of the weird things. Um, I said to my wife, it's if I was Sir David Beckham or Sir David Attenborough or somebody really famous, but at the end of the day, I'm just Nick Fewings. I said, but it's, and I find it weird that people still want a signed sign <laughs> Do you know what? I've been organising PA events for, I realise it's 20 years, um, like, it's just over 20 years, and every time I've done conferences and there's been an author on, like, the assistants love having their books signed, they yeah. always have done. Like, yeah. if we've got any authors on that speaker programme, we always have to set up a little table at the back <laughs> yeah. after, because they love it, absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but so. I, I guess it's quite nice to have that personalised. I mean, a lot of the books on my bookshelves behind me are signed by the yeah. authors. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, mean, is... I, I love doing it, but I just... Mm. <laughs> you don't want half writers either. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so every day something new comes up, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd send it off to um, the Association of Project Management there. They have a magazine that goes out to 33,000 members. <laughs> And they said they wanted to review my book. And um, I just sent it off, PDF copy, and also a, a paper copy, hard copy. Um, next thing I know, it's it's been it's been reviewed, and it was a really good review, um, by Richard Noble. Um, and I thought, who's Richard Noble? He's an OBE, and he, he drove Thrust 2 to the land speed record. 640 miles an hour um held the held the record for i think 14 years and then he directed the car that currently uh, holds a record which is 700 plus miles an hour and and i'm just thinking oh my goodness uh, you know for this sort of person to review review the book i've read so it's it's fascinating just different things each day oh, that's um, amazing well, Nick, I think, you know, we always like to end off the conversation, you know, with a little takeaway, a little nugget of gold, a little piece of advice. Is there something from the book that comes to mind or something from your experience, your, I mean, your 20 years in training, one little key nugget you'd like to leave with the executive assistant or anyone else listening to this podcast? Yes, I, I, I'd, I'd say the key thing is if you are part of a team, the key thing is make sure everyone knows and understands what your team exists to do. So your team purpose, the amount of teams that I've gone into and I, say, and I work with them and I say, are you a team? And they all nod their heads and go, yeah, we're a team. And I say, OK, individually write down what does your team exist to do? Mm. And invariably, if it's a team of 10 uh, and I've had it with leadership teams, operational uh, project teams, invariably you get 10 different answers. Which is confusing mm. and it means that people go off on their own little paths and do their own little thing because they don't understand what they should be doing. Yeah. Um Simon Sinek start, says about starting with why. Um, similar to that, I think the why is the, the last thing, which is the benefits. You never get anybody come up to you and say, uh, initially, oh, what's your name? Uh, Anel, hi, Anel, what do, you, what do you, they say, what do you do? They don't say, why do you do it? Yeah. 
So it should be, what does your team exist to do? What does that enable? And what are the benefits? Those are the three key things. So yes, I think for 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 assistants who uh, are part of a team, um, that little activity is really worthwhile and beneficial to test out with the team the next time you have a team meeting. Hopefully, face to face and not hybrid behind. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Nick, I think that that touches on such an important point. You know, if you are trying to get your team to be empowered and to, to take ownership of what they do. You know, then you don't need to micromanage if everyone knows. It's like saying, we're packing the bag, we're going to London. If I know what we're doing in London and I will get there on my own feet, you do not have to give me every waypoint on the way to London. So I think, like you say, we understand why we do you know, yeah. what is it that we're here to do and just get that that first level alignment. Then when you have to execute or when a problem arises, you have that information and you can get to that destination. So I think that is very, very valuable, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's been a thoroughly enjoyable hour, as I knew it would be with you. Um, so thank you so much. And I know the assistants are going to really enjoy listening to this one. Thank you. Great, Thank my you. pleasure. And uh, yeah, just wishing everybody continued success and happiness in what you do in work and in life. And um, yeah, keep shouting how bloody good you are <laughs> and the value that you add to uh, teams and organisations. Amen, Amen to that. that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining this episode of the Assistant Lab. If you enjoyed this content, you know what you need to do. Feel free to share it and help us grow our subscriber base. Join us again next time. And until then, keep experimenting, innovating and improving your skill sets.